Good morning, church. Good morning. It's good to see you all. Welcome. It's great to be together. It's great to look into my screen and see your beaming faces this morning. And here we are gathered to worship. We're glad you're here. This is a time for us to center and to rediscover our sacred center. So let's begin with our worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Those little um, 
baby noises at the end of that hymn were just perfect. The perfect ending, reminding us of life and its vitality. Let's gather in prayer. God of all time and whose presence has accompanied all of history, we pause on this day called Sabbath as a reminder to ourselves that we are not machines. Our souls, like our bodies, need to be refreshed through rest. Your wisdom tells us that we were meant for work, for livelihood, and to create. But on this day, you remind us to focus on you, the creator, the one whose spirit and breath fills the world and our being. O God of all creation, bring us to the flowing stream of your word so that our parched lives might drink of your goodness and love. Take us to the mountaintop of your realm so that we might gaze upon that which is true and just. And God, take us to the oceans of mercy and generosity and care so that we might find joy in living. God, we come to worship seeking all these things, knowing your presence is forever with us, as is your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, I think Anne is going to read our scripture for us this morning. Welcome, Anne. Thank you. Reading from scripture, Genesis 13, 1 through 18. So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the Negeb. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. He journeyed on by stages from the Negeb as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them living together for their possessions were so great that they could not live together. And there was strife between the herders of Abram's livestock and the herders of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites lived in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife between you and me and between your herders and my herders, for we are kindred. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. Lot looked about him and saw that the plain of the Jordan was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zor. This was before the Lord had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the plain of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the plain, and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, Raise your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring can also be counted. Rise up, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of the Marm, which are at Hebron, 
and there he built an altar to the Lord. Thank you, Anne. And thanks for joining us this morning as we continue our series on the book of Genesis, specifically the story of Abraham and Sarah, who are our ancestors in faith. It was Abraham and Sarah who moved in faith, trusting God. God was doing something new, creating a new people, and maybe more importantly, a new way of life. So listen to this story. Well, I want to begin by um, telling you that I grew up with um, two brothers, um, and I learned pretty quickly that conflict was inevitable. Sometimes the conflict emerged because we shared a particular space uh, and wanted different things. You see, I shared a bedroom with my two brothers, and that meant pretty close quarters. My brother liked to talk to his girlfriend on the phone all hours of the night, and I wanted to get some sleep. We each wanted something different, and it led to conflict. Sometimes conflicts are formed because we want the same thing. We sometimes, my brother and I, would share our clothing, and I can still remember fighting with my brother over wanting to wear the same shirt that day for school. Now, there were plenty of shirts in the closet, but for some reason, we would argue and tussle over wearing this one particular suit. Well, when I think of Abram and Lot, I think of an uncle, Abram, and his nephew, Lot. And they became locked in a deep, divisive struggle, not over wearing the same shirt, but over the same piece of land, land their combined livestock needed to stay alive. You know, family fights can be as tense, as intense as any there are. And in the conflict between Abram and Lot, tensions reached a fever pitch. But then Abram decided to try another approach to the impasse. Abram generously suggested that he and Lot separate. It was a generous solution because Abram gave Lot first choice on which piece of land to take. If Lot wanted to stay on the existing land, Abram would move. And if Lot wanted to move, Abram would then stay on the existing land. It was also a very generous solution for Abram to propose for another reason. God had promised Abram a ton of descendants, but it wasn't clear how that was going to happen because Abram's wife, Sarai, could not conceive. That meant that Lot, as the nephew, was the heir apparent. He would be the one through whom the family lineage would continue. You see, when Lot's father, Haran, died and left him orphaned, Abram became Lot's de facto father. It was both religious and social custom for Abram to care for Lot. But now that Lot was old enough to strike out on his own, this meant that Abram would be losing that son, that heir. It was a generous solution, but also a painful solution for Abram. In order to make peace, he had to give up the thing he most wanted to hold on to. Lot ended up choosing the more beautiful and fertile land 
near the River Jordan Plain. It was compared to God's garden, a reference to Eden, and also compared to the rich Nile River Valley. At first blush, it, it appeared as if Lot got the better end of the deal. Abram, on the other hand, was left with the land of Canaan. And later in this biblical story, we will learn that Lot, having chosen the rich and beautiful land, also placed himself in an environment of danger. Lot seems to have modeled a different kind of interest. Pure self-interest, as opposed to Abram. Now that Lot was separated from, separated from Abram, he would no longer become part of Israel, no longer part of the chosen family. But here's the thing I want you to remember today. He was not rejected by Abram, never. I believe that in Abram, we find the beginning of a servant person, a servant culture. That servant culture doesn't mean that boundaries have to be obliterated and that they are no longer helpful. In fact, they are often necessary. Servanthood doesn't mean that we can't have real differences. It doesn't mean that we have to believe the same things in order to get along. And it doesn't mean we can't serve one another, even though we may find ourselves on different sides of the so-called aisle. Now, our current political climate is deeply marred by the inability of either party, and I want to underscore this, the inability of either party to engage around serving each other toward better ends. Instead, everything is self-serving. And, and I quote here, winning at any cost. Norms, decency, and most certainly compromise have given way to sheer political brute power. The most recent episode unfolded this past week. During the 2016 so-called Biden rule named after Senator Joe Biden. This rule was repeatedly invoked during 2016 as a rationale, as a norm, as a convention for the Senate denying a hearing for President Obama's choice for a Supreme Court vacancy during an election year. Everyone went on the record saying it was the Biden rule that prevented this nomination from going for four years later in 2020 when a supreme court vacancy came available after the death of ruth bader ginsburg and just before a national election suddenly there is a new a new made up rationale a new ad hoc justification for the senate to go ahead with filling a supreme court vacancy you can see the inconsistency and you can see how this will continue to embitter both sides and the American people, our nation, will lose because of it. Now, the Constitution is on the Senate's side and therefore this will move forward. However, this is the most important thing. Norms, decency, civility, all these things that must accompany the Constitution, they're gone. And so what we have is that the letter of the law will be followed, but certainly not the spirit of the law. And that will create cynicism and distrust, and it will not move us ahead. This is the lesson from Abram back at the very beginning of Genesis. Boundaries, borders, and differences are important, 
but how we engage those borders, boundaries, and differences are just as important. Abram did not wall lot off now that they possessed different lands. Their separation did not mean rejection from each other. In fact, as the biblical story unfolds, it is Abram who continues to be concerned for Lot's welfare, even though they've separated, even though they've had conflict. First, he rescues Lot from um, a capture by some kings who are at war with the cities on the Jordan Plain. And then later in Genesis, some have argued when Abram bargains with God to spare Sodom from destruction, it's because of the righteous still living there, including Lot. You see, being concerned and caring for those whose location, whose beliefs are different from ours, whose values are different from ours, and whose outlooks are different from ours is what true servanthood is about, serving the whole. The boundaries and beliefs that separate us from others do not require us to be cruel or uncaring or dismissive of those who are different from us. So may we be like Abram and find the deepest reserves within us to care for and respect others, including those who are very different from us. Amen.
Thank you so much, Laura McLennan and Paige and Grow. Thank you so much. That was the next best thing to being there. <laughs> um, and yet, um, even through um, technology, we were all able to feel the beauty and love um, that was transmitted. Thank you so much. Each Sunday when we gather, we invite folks to share um, the things that are uh, of utmost importance of utmost importance to them. These are um, sometimes they come in the form of a prayer concern. Um, sometimes it's sharing a joy. Um, it could be a way in which you experience the holy this week uh, and want to share that as well. So I'm just going to take a moment to um, open it up to those of you who would like to offer something. Simply unmute um, and share your, um, your thought or your petition uh, or your joy. Uh, and then we'll gather all of these up in prayer. Pastor Dale, this is Kathy Barton. Um, I have a prayer request for you today for a young boy who is the grandson of one of my friends. Um, he has been diagnosed with vasculitis. He's a second year college student on a scholarship and um, he is extremely sick. All of his um, vital organs are failing. Um, he's going to start chemotherapy this week with the hope that he will get better. But even if he does, he will um, have to live in a bubble and will really be very isolated for the rest of his life. I've been praying every day that somehow this can be cured and this is the only place to get that answered. So I'd like to bring it up. His name is Tony and um, I'm just wishing the best for him. Kathy, thank you so very much for, um, for walking this journey with Tony and his family. Um, we're, we're so grateful for people like you who include others. Um, any other prayer requests or joys or what we call God sightings? Uh, this is Nancy Piasecki, friend of Wences. Uh, I have a prayer request for all of the people in the South who were hit by the hurricane uh, several weeks ago, as well as for the people in Oregon and California with the fires. I think so often when we see this on the news every night, uh, it's right there in the front of our minds, but three or four weeks down the road, those people still are without their homes, without anything they ever had. And that pain and suffering and um, hurt just does not go away. And I think sometimes the rest of us just move on with our safe, happy little lives. And those people right now still, and for a long time, are not going to have uh, safe, happy little lives. Nancy, thank you so much. You're so right about that. We, our lives tend to be swimming with the media in that once a story moves on, uh, we seem to forget that the devastation and the pain remains and that it will take years uh, for recovery. And so I'm appreciative for you reminding us to keep the people of the South, people of California and Oregon in your prayers, those who have been affected by these wildfires. Um, Thank you. Yes, Dale, uh, this is Richard and I'm just asking, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I've got the right words for this, but uh, today at, at sundown, I believe uh, starts uh, Yom Kippur. And I just ask that the prayers of the Jewish faith uh, uh, and the uh, fasting and the various things that they give up for the 24 hour period uh, carry through to help all of the world. Uh, 
I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Yes. Remembering our Jewish brothers and sisters. I wanted to say, Dale, that uh, in the Reading newspaper on Friday, there was an urgent plea for O, o blood type donors. And um, I was able to make an appointment uh, in five minutes Saturday morning and gave blood. And I got a mask for doing it. <laughs> but if anybody can, can give blood right now, um, it's very desperately needed all around. Who do we contact for, to do that? Well, I donate through the Miller Keystone Blood Bank, and you can find them online. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. I, again, I'm moved by the generosity of heart that um, we're experiencing here today, uh, giving blood, um, praying for um, loved ones who are struggling um, with life-threatening diseases, um, praying for our fellow citizens of uh, California, Oregon, and the South. Anything else before we, um, before we move into a place of prayer? By the way, I might, I might add that um, I will be offering prayer this morning, but I, I think one of the things that I've been most recently um, coming to understand more fully is that uh, when we keep a neighbor in our prayers, um, we're praying. When we give blood, we're praying. It's a form of prayer, a form of honoring the sacredness of life. When we think of neighbors who have been stricken by wildfires, we're praying. Um, these don't have to be formal acts as much as um, affections of the heart that God most certainly hears. So thank you all for the ways that you pray and maybe in ways that you're not even realizing our prayer, but they are. Let's gather in prayer. O oh, Holy One who created the world and said it was good, we are thankful for Abram and Sarai, our spiritual ancestors, who instead of running from your call and summons, journeyed in faith to a new place and a new beginning. We now are the beneficiaries of their courage, their steadfast faith, and their perseverance. And we give thanks that Abraham cared for his nephew Lot, and even though conflicts and tensions arose, Abram trusted your generosity, gracious God. We too often live lives in which scarcity drives our fear. Oh God, you promise us abundance, but our self-seeking lives convince us that scarcity is real. And so we find ourselves living in fearful ways instead of in generous ways. Allow us, God, to be like Abram and ask those with whom we are in conflict with what they need. Sometimes we get so stuck on our principles that we become blinded to solutions. We become blinded to compromise. We become blinded to working together. Animosity and division, God, takes so much energy energy that could be put to good solutions and paths forward. I'm afraid, Lord, that we boiled life down to either or, and we've lost the ability to find the third way. On this day, healing God, be with those who are sick, weak, who are so easily forgotten in the hustle of politics and power. In particular, on this morning, we pray for Tony and for his family. We pray for the victims of hurricanes and wildfires. We pray for our Jewish brothers and sisters 
during this moment of Yom Kippur. We pray for those who give blood, who are thinking of their neighbors. O oh God, the sick, the weak, the disadvantaged, these are the people Jesus came to earth to show us how to care for them. Prevent us, God, from turning away from them, from turning our backs on those whose lives are literally on the edge. And today we pray all of these things, remembering Jesus, who taught us to pray this prayer. And this is the New Zealand version. So pray with me. Eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echo through the universe. May the way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created things. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. I think Mike, um, Mike Todd is chatted down below, directing those of you who would like to give blood. Um, he's he's put a contact down there for you. Um, Mike, I think Mike Todd is my Mr. Footnote. Uh, every time we need a, a source, he's right there, and I'm grateful for that. Oh, it was Tiffany. Thank you, Tiffany. <laughs> Thank you, Todds. Um, <laughs> Mike says she knows much more than I do. <laughs> uh, we love you folks. Um, the other thing, you probably saw some commercials on the chat regarding our once, uh, our October Wentz, um, which is our, which is our, um, our beer festival in times of COVID is what this means. Uh, we're doing um, this event on October 10th. And so we'd like you to uh, make a food order uh, by Sunday, um, October 4th. And um, pay attention to the emails you get. It will give you all the information you need in terms of how to order a, a fantastic dinner and uh, a brew if you want one, okay? Um, is there anything that we need to share or um, bless each other with this morning before we conclude worship? All right. Well, um, before we go to our postlude, let me um, offer this blessing. Of course, this is a very, very, very ancient blessing. Um, and it has been carried down through the generations. I modify it every once in a while, but essentially uh, its truth is real. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may God give you peace today, tomorrow, and for all time. Amen.
Okay, I, um, this is the time when we sort of, it's a free for all in terms of saying goodbye to one another. So goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Have a great week. Bye. 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 Goodbye, everybody. Have a great week. Have a great week, everyone. Bye. Bye, mate. Bye bye. 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 Bye.